the Lord. Amen. Amen. God, God is wonderful. He is good all the time. All the time, God is good. We know that. Amen. Yeah. Let's be faithful. Let's be faithful. Serve Him. Stand for Him. Love Him. Serve Him. However God has called you. Wherever you're planted. It's not the, the corny term, bloom where you're planted. But it's truth. And uh, let God use you right where you're at. And uh, as He moves you, move with Him. Okay? I just encourage you that way. So... Uh, we have somebody that uh, we would have loved to have just kept right here in Canton, Illinois for a long time. And, uh, but, you know, she heard the call of God, and I still remember your commissioning service that we had here, Nancy. It was such a beautiful time. And uh, the family of God just gathered around. So I would love to just encourage Nancy to come and just share your heart, take your liberty here, and, and, and we just... Would love to hear a few words from you. Amen. Amen. Come on. And you probably want to introduce you. Yes. I'll okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. You bet. Good morning, church. Good morning. It's really, really good to be back with you. There's a lot of new faces, um, and I'm really happy to see that. There's. Um, some old faces too, of course, and I didn't get to greet everybody before church, so I want to see you afterwards. <laughs> um, for those of you, you, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Nancy Kinzel. I belong to Chuck and Brenda back there. Um, <laughs> yes, um, and I grew up in this church. This is my home church. And um, two and a half years ago, y'all commissioned me to go to Papua New Guinea with Wycliffe Bible Translators. And um, it's been a wild ride since then. <laughs> I got to Papua New Guinea right before COVID. Um, so I got there January 2020. And then COVID came to Papua New Guinea in March of 2020. And uh, that changed the whole trajectory of what I thought was going to happen. Um, I had gone to translate the Bible. That was what my education had been for. It had been prepping me for that. And that's what my calling was, or at least I thought it was. Um, I was convinced I was going to go to a vernacular language group and just, just sit down there for 10, 15, 20 years and translate the Bible. Um, but COVID changed that plan, and God was in it. It's not COVID. It's, it's God, right? Um, yeah, it's God. So... Uh, March of 2020, I was actually in the village doing um, village, um, what's it called? Village orientation, uh, just like you learn talk pisin and you learn the culture, and so you, you just plunk down in, in, a, in a village and you see how you how you do. Do you float or do you swim? Do you die? Um, <laughs> um, so that's when COVID came actually, and so they had to evacuate me. Um, <clears throat> and so they evacuated all the newbies, and we went back to the center, Ukrumpa, and um, everything went into lockdown. And it was a strict lockdown. You couldn't hardly leave your house. Um, you couldn't go to your neighbors. And so that was, that was a bit difficult because I, had, I was brand new to the, to the country and expecting to allocate to a language group. Um, but if I'm locked into my house, how do I get to a language group? And so um, for about five months, Ukrumpa, my center there in, in Papua New Guinea was in lockdown and I couldn't do anything. Um, and actually, um, I'm traveling with friends today, Sam and Deb Smucker, um, and Ab their daughter Abigail. You guys can wave so everybody can see you. <laughs> so those are my co-workers in Papua New Guinea. Um, they were about the first people to finally get work started again in 2020. And they had an oral Bible translation workshop happening. And I said, please send me. I want to do something this year. Um, and so I went to their province, uh, East Epic province. And that's where my guy is from, Amos Dagoon. He can wave his hand, too. <laughs> So brought a piece of back, piece of Papua New Guinea back with me. <laughs> um, so I was with Sam and Deb. They had an oral Bible translation workshop. Um, so my training had really been oriented towards written translation of the Bible. And what they're focusing on out there in the CPIC is oral means of how to communicate the, communicate the gospel and do discipleship through oral means. And so um, they're even trying to translate the Bible orally. 
And so I got to go and see that, see that process, and really fell in love with it. Um, met Amos there, and um, things started to happen after that. <laughs> Decided, really realized that I wasn't going to be able to allocate to a language group um, during COVID because it was just going to be so complicated. And so I really felt God's leading to join their team there in the CPIC and um, learn how to do scripture engagement. How do I engage people um, with the scripture? How do I do discipleship in this country? Um, and I also knew that they would teach me a lot of culture and a lot of talk business. And so I said, yes, this is where I should be for this first term at least. And um, got plugged in, into there. So I've been with them since um, full time since 2021. Um, the, a lot has happened since then. <laughs> um, April last year, a dog attacked my face and um, nearly ripped off half of my nose. I have pictures on my phone if you want to see it, but it's pretty gnarly. Um, so it's okay if you don't. <laughs> um, I was back in Ukurumpa actually when it happened, and it was very serious. Um, I had four hour, four or six hours before um, the skin would start to die and my nose would fall off basically, and I would have half a nostril. Um, and so they, the whole team there in Papua New Guinea was just working really, really hard to get me to um, a doctor that could sew up my nose, a plastic surgeon who could do it well, because even your average doctor couldn't sew it up well. Um, but they did. There was a, um, a couple doctors in a different province, Jiwaka province, and they flew me by helicopter, plunked me down. Deb came with me. She was my, my caretaker. And... Um, there was two plastic surgeons that sewed up my nose in three different layers. It was probably about 100 stitches. Um, and so that is just a testimony of God, of how I have a nose. <laughs> yeah. So I just give praise to him. Um, it happened on my birthday. So I get to say that I had a, a nose job for my birthday. Um, <laughs> Yes, um, but God's, God's care, God's generosity, his protection, it was really close to my eye. God protected my eye. Um, I could be blind in one eye. Um, I could have a hard time breathing, and I could look very disfigured, but none of those things are accurate. None of those things are true. God was very generous in the way he cared for me, and uh, thank you for all your prayers. I know that you guys were praying for me, and I really, really appreciate that. really feel that strongly, so thank you. Um, and then, of course, last year, my mom had some health problems, and that was hard to be in Papua New Guinea when that was happening. So thank you, too, for caring for her and just um, round, like, sorry, I was starting to start, talk present. Um, <laughs> thank you for surrounding her and caring for her and, and looking after her, because it's hard to be away when that happens, and you feel like, oh, what am I doing here? Like, I should be back where my family needs me. So thank you for that. Um, and then um, so I started dating Amos Dagoon last year um, and this year was it this year already? okay it was this year that he proposed and we're getting married in October 1st um, <laughs> yeah so I did not go to meet a man, I promise you. Um, I was <laughs> very happy being single, um, had no intention of finding a guy, um, especially a Papua New Guinean, just because our cultures are so very opposite from one another. And so this will take a lot of, a lot of, lot of work, um, a lot of patience, and a lot of forgiveness, and a lot of grace to make this marriage work well. And we do want it to work well. Um, we really want to have a marriage that is a witness and is a strong uh, signal to other people in Papua New Guinea um, what a marriage can look like and how it can honor God and how it can be a picture of how God unites us all. Um, so please pray for us as we do that. Like even this trip back has, has brought up some issues and we're working through it and it's like, it's, it's just a lot. And, and poor Amos too is like overwhelmed by American culture and all that he's seeing. So if you think about Amos, you can pray for him. Um, it's been a, it's been a huge adjustment. Um, but I just thank you for all your prayers and your faithful support. Um, I've never had to worry about where I'm going to sleep or where my next meal is coming from because you guys are all so, so faithful. Um, and I really, it, it, it's touching. Every time Amos come over, comes over to my house and we have a meal, he prays for you guys. And he says, thank you, Lord, for the partners that sent Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> 
so thank you. Um, I will be coming back to furlough, or coming back on furlough next year. This is a short trip. I'm only here for in the U.S. for about six weeks, and that's really so that Amos could see America. He could meet my family. Abigail over there could see some schools. <laughs> um, so I will be here. Amos and I will be here for about another two weeks ish, and then we're back to Papua New Guinea. Um, but we'll be back next year, around May or so, um, for our furlough, and we'll be married by then. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing you guys then, and we're just going to soak up the time that we have now with you. Um, so like I said, I want to see some of you guys that I didn't get to greet before, um, and I love you. Thank you so much for, for being my family. I love you so much. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to have to get moving because i got about an hour and a half left, so okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I just wanted to finish a, a couple thoughts from last week. We, uh, when we were together two weeks ago, we were looking at just so many of the attributes and the characteristics and the faithfulness of God, and we read through the scriptures, and there was over 60 different accounts all the way, you know, from Abraham to Paul and, and just how God provided for, for each and every one of them in so many distinct ways and how he does for us. But yet, even in the middle of all of that provision, even in the middle of all the testimonies, there are times that we doubt. There are times that we struggle with. I mean, we, we can know that we know that we know, but there are times that we doubt. And some of the reasons that we doubt are mainly due to the life experiences that we have had, things that we've walked through, situations. You know, uh, I, I mentioned that little boy uh, who had uh, been told his whole life, don't go near the grill, right, when it's hot, okay? But when his grandpa was, was grilling, he snuck behind the grill and he put both hands on that grill. That life experience now has taught him that that grill is hot because he had second degree burns on his little hands. He's perfectly fine. But the truth is, is that sometimes life experience could do that. I would imagine that that dog experience, okay, could probably have affected, you know, how we just approach, you know, those things. But regardless of what you have experienced in your life, whether it's individuals that have let you down, leaders that maybe disappointed you or were great, it all shapes how we can interpret life and we can filter you know, all of those things in our soul realm, our mind, our will, our emotions, and we can kind of live out of that realm if we're not careful. But we were also created with a spirit. It comes alive when we're born again and Jesus Christ is living on the inside of us and Holy Spirit. And, and we know that the scriptures teach us to walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. Don't find it a surprise, friend, when you, you struggle sometimes because there's parts of us. Our flesh always wants to regain control of the throne of our life. And that's why Paul said we have to crucify that flesh every day. We got to put that thing down, okay? And we can walk in the Spirit of God with assurance and with faith. But there are times that we do doubt. There are times that we could be praying for a situation. Maybe you're praying for somebody or you, you look at this situation and you think it's absolutely impossible. I want to tell you something. It might be impossible for me, but everything is possible for our God. God can take every situation in this life and he can somehow use it for his good. I've explained to you the, one of the things that got me turned toward God was the, the death of my best friend, you know, and that's, that's been many, many years ago now, but seeing him die in, suddenly in a car accident, tragedy in this life, it's the John 16, 33 moment, in this life you will have trouble, but Jesus said in me you will have peace. And see, I didn't understand the peace part. I wanted to blame God for that thing. 
But what I saw was that in this life, I'm going to have trouble. I'm going to have tribulation. Bad things are going to happen. But in Christ, even despite the trouble and all the things that I go through, I can still have peace in Jesus Christ. And when I finally surrendered my life and gave my life to Jesus and said, God, take me as I am, as knuckleheaded as I am, I will serve you with everything that I got. You can have everything, Lord God. And he didn't look down at me and scold me for all the horrible things I did. He wrapped his arms around me and he picked me up and he held me and he gave me faith and assurance. And yet there's still times in my journey that I doubt and I find that in those moments I still have to run back to the arms of my father. And you know what? Those arms haven't changed. They're the same arms that were there for me 35 years ago. They're the same arms that were there for me when I was a little kid. And they're the same arms that are there for me today and tomorrow. And they're the same arms that one day I'm going to step into His presence in glory and know Him face to face. Isn't that beautiful? Woo! I love that. So when we look at doubt, when we look at experiences, the thing that we need to understand is this. You and I are not of this kingdom, okay? We know you don't have to look far. Culture is going in a different direction. Culture is flowing in a complete opposite direction. It's an antichrist, okay? We, though, are not living for this culture. So if you can somehow try to pull yourself out of that a little bit and realize that when we get down in it, sometimes we're veiled a little bit and we don't see clearly. But when we can push back a little bit and turn our eyes heavenward, we can understand that we are not living in this culture. And we can stand not in the things that are going on in this world, but we can stand in God's word. We can stand in his truth. We can stand in his presence. We can experience joy even when we go through pain. That's the God that you and I serve, and that's the spirit realm. Now, last week, we looked at a couple examples. The first one we looked at, and these were some things that help us overcome doubt, okay? One of the first things we looked at was the uh, Roman centurion, right? And we understood that one one of the biggest pieces of really overcoming doubt is not living for me, myself, and I, but living under an authority greater than I. And that authority greater than I is God. Amen? We understand that His Word is the supreme authority. There was a reason why Jesus mentioned that this Roman centurion, okay, was the one He said, I've never in Israel have I seen such great faith. You mean all those great religious leaders, all those great teachers, all those Pharisees and everybody else, they they had it all together, right? They were prophets, got it going on. But he said, yet in this man, okay, he saw great faith. There was an un way, there was there, there was something inside of him that recognized Jesus as the supreme authority because he was a man that was under authority. And I will tell you, we live in a world where people want authority. But you cannot have authority that you are not first under. You cannot have authority in a place without taking the responsibility for that authority. And I can't operate in that if I'm not first under it. So we want the blessings of God. But often we want the blessings of God on our terms. I want the blessings of God. And it's not just some cosmic formula that I just recite over and over. No, I want the blessings of God, but it's just like this morning. I want every single person that we prayed for this morning, and I stand by this in faith that they will be healed. I want to see it now, though, don't I? I want it snap, crackle, bang, boom. I want it done, and sometimes that happens. But I will tell you, when we pray, we stand believing, we do what the Scriptures tell us to do, and then we leave it with God. Amen? We follow what Scripture tells us. We come under the supreme authority, but I come out from under that authority when I put a demand as far as how that's going to manifest. The manifestation is always in God's hands. And we have to trust that. 
we do our part. Can we agree with that today? That's his word, you see. We come under the supreme authority. So we recognize that coming under authority, the protection and the provision of God is so important for our lives. It means that sometimes it's not the popular decision because some of our friends don't always want to do what the supreme authority says. And believe it or not, I got to tell you something, even in church, (laughs) even in church, sometimes we don't want to do what the supreme authority says. Can you believe that? I mean, I mean, Christians, aren't they just perfect, right? We, we don't have anything wrong. We never struggle. We, we're just like super faith living in the clouds, people, right? Wrong. <laughs> it's important to live under authority, and that will help. That's just one aspect of overcoming doubt. We also looked at the account when Peter came to the disciples out on the boat, right? They had just been in a situation where Jesus fed 5,000 families, and the the disciples saw the miracle happen right in their hands. Jesus broke the bread, right? He gave it to them in in the fish, and the miracle happened as they were faithful to distribute, and it happened right in their hands. So they're on an all-time high. Man, they're faith-filled, but they're out on the the lake, and they started thinking like fishermen again. And while they're out there on the lake, Jesus came to them in an unconventional way. Remember, God colors outside the lines when he wants to. And as he did that, they were screaming, it's a ghost! Oh my goodness, it's a ghost! But thank God there was one of them in the boat, Peter. He's just like, well, I think that's him. And he said, if it's you, Lord, tell me to come. Well, come. So Peter got out of the boat, and we know what happened. As he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was walking on water. He was doing the thing that God called him to do, but he had to step out of the boat to see the miracle happen. I believe that many of them in that boat could have actually followed suit. Had they kept their eyes on Christ in the moment, but they were latching on to the the boat thinking like mere fishermen. And sometimes we do that in our lives. But that's one of the things that's important in overcoming doubt. Sometimes we just have to step out. And we looked at the aspect of tithing, and I'm not going to go into all that right now. But it's, it's a matter of when you do it, and you step out in faith, you see that God actually blesses And he removes, you know, whatever thing that you've been hanging on to with that. Because, friends, the whole thing is really a self-reliance that just has to be taken care of. If you want to overcome doubt, we got to overcome this. we got to overcome that person in the mirror. And we got to begin to trust our supreme authority and his word and live by it. But there are times that we have to step out. Fear is something that grips and debilitates people over and over and over. Can I just say the devil's a liar? It's the voice of a liar that many listen to. And he wants nothing more than to rob, kill, and destroy everything that, he's, that good is going on in your life. He hates what Jesus is doing in your life. And he will do everything he can to try to ensnare you and pull you back into the, your old coping methods. And you want to know why you're so, so, so miserable when you go back to those old coping methods? Because now you have something inside of you that is grieving every time that you go back there. You're completely miserable because you know that there's something far better available to you. But it's like you're trying to suppress that thing and satisfy something else. That's where we just got to get out of that pig pen and realize that God has something far greater for us. And he pulls us back. But often it requires us to step out, and often it requires us to overcome our fears. Now, the last one that I want to look at today is this. I want to look at Luke chapter 7. If you want to turn there, if you have your Bible whether it's your tree version or digital, whatever you got, that's fine. And I know some of you are already looking at Facebook right now, so whatever, you know. (laughs) It's all good. 
says this, verse 18, Luke chapter 7. Jesus and John the Baptist. John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent, these, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Verse 21, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and what you have heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear and the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who who does not stumble on account of me. John's messengers left. Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? He's talking about John the Baptist now. A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? (laughs) No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one, speaking of John, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Why on earth the greatest prophet Ever. Why was John doubting? Why did he have to ask the question? Is this really you? Do you see how it can creep in to anybody? The greatest prophet. This is the one when Jesus came out of the wilderness and came down to the Jordan, right? And he saw the Spirit of God descend upon Jesus. He heard the voice of God say, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. John made the declaration, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He made the declaration, but yet... Something transpired while he was in captivity. I don't know if it was just his humanness that got a hold of him. I don't know if it was maybe some of the reports. Maybe he thought that Jesus was going to come onto the scene and everybody was going to receive him. And maybe he heard that his brothers in in Israel weren't really receiving Jesus all that well. I don't know what was contributing to this in John's life, but I know that it crept in there. John the Baptist, greater than all the prophets, no one greater than John is what Jesus said. Why the question? He baptized Jesus for the fulfillment of the Scriptures. I don't know, maybe it was the harsh circumstances that he was under. Maybe it was just getting to him. Maybe he was facing just this idea that, you know, now Jesus came and now I'm thrown in jail. Maybe he heard again how Israel had been rejecting Jesus. Whatever the reason, I don't know what it was, but something got in there. The enemy always wants to make us question things. It's no different than in the garden. Is that really what he meant? Is that really what God said? That's how he works. But here's the thing that encourages me. John made the request to his followers to ask Jesus a simple question. Is it really you? Because right now I'm not seeing things so clearly. 
right now I'm kind of going through it. Right now, I just don't understand everything that's happening. And, and I just need some reassurance. Is it really you? I'm going to bring this in for a landing. So he sent the messengers out to Jesus. Messengers go on out to Jesus, right? And they say, Jesus, hey, I hate to interrupt you. I know you're healing right now. You're doing all these great things. But John, John just wants, he's got a question for you. He just wants to know, is it really you? Now, Jesus kept healing. He kept touching people. He kept charging the atmosphere, bringing assurance to the messengers that they could see it with their visible eyes. You know the one thing Jesus didn't do? He didn't scold them. He didn't scold them and tell them how horrible they were for doubting. Oh, you doubters. You know what he did? He simply expressed the Father's heart. And Jesus always is about restoration and bringing us back to truth. And Jesus just needed to encourage John. So he said to the messengers, Guys, look, you see what's happening here. There's people being healed. The blind, they now see. The lepers, the untouchables of society, they're cleansed. The dead, are being raised. Go and tell John that these things are happening. In other words, just tell John, redirect him back to the heart of the Father. Redirect him back to that place. Encourage him and assure him, it is I. It's not about his circumstance. It's not about his imprisonment. It's not about the fact that he was facing a certain death. It was about the fact that he did what he was called to do. He was the forerunner of the King of glory. And he faithfully fulfilled what God called him to do. You think it was easy to be out there having a diet of insects and locusts or whatever that thing is? We laugh at that, friends. I'm sure there were times in his life that he wanted maybe something a little more to fill his belly. But he was more concerned with doing the will of the Father than his personal gain and enjoyment in this life. He was more concerned about the call of God that was on his life than his personal comfort and ease. And when he signed up for that, maybe he didn't know he was going to be thrown in jail, but maybe he did. But when the reality came, when he had been put in that dungeon and seemingly forgotten by people, he asked, hey, will somebody just help me here? I'm just kind of wondering. Would you just ask him, is it really him? I believe. I help my unbelief. And Jesus just cradled him in those arms again and loved him right where he was. You see, friends, you might have times in your life and in your walk and in your journey that you doubt. But the question I encourage you to ask God in all of it, Lord, just get quiet by yourself. Go to your secret place. And just say, God, is it really you? Are you really with me? And I assure you, he will answer a resounding yes. And more than that, 
he will say, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I'm going with you all the way to the end. God never does anything halfway, friends. He will never leave us and he will never forsake us. Is life hard sometimes? Yes. Do we doubt sometimes? Yes. But it's okay to ask the question, is it really you, Lord? And he will answer. Can you receive that today? John, the greatest prophet, hallelujah, even he had doubts. Amen? Even he was one that struggled at times. That's powerful stuff. When I read that, I'm just like, my goodness, the greatest prophet of all time. You know, and I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, we look at ourselves, I look at myself, and I'm just like, you're just like a worm, man. (laughs) I look at guys like Paul, guys like Joseph, holy cow. You see what these guys did? Amazing things for God, but yet they all had struggles. They all had insecurities. They all had things that they dealt with. It's okay to have questions, but it's also okay to receive the assurance from God and not live with the question forever. And I will tell you, if you do that and begin to apply it to your life more and more and more and more, you will see yourself growing and maturing as as your journey goes on and on.